And uh, so uh, my name is uh, Daniel Lucio, and uh, I'll be giving you this uh, seminar about um, and it's a quick introduction about HPC and supercomputing. Um, I'm, I hope that at the end of this seminar, you will know the basics on what is a supercomputer and what makes a computer a supercomputer. So here's a quick uh, overview on the, the different items that I'm planning to talk about to you today. So uh, first things first, let's talk about units. So, hi, yeah, well, um, there are two units, well, especially one is called flops. I don't know if you have never heard of it, but uh, that's a very important unit in uh, the supercomputing world. Uh, flops stands for floating point operations per second, and it's just basically a unit that is used to measure the capacity or the power of a computing system, especially a, a supercomputer. Um, and also, there is another unit called MIPS. That one is not used very much. I don't think it's very common. You'll find it on books. Um, that one is used to measure the uh, integer operations per second. Uh, so you can see the difference. One is for floating point, and the other one is for integer. So when we talk about supercomputers, and you want to see how powerful they are, uh, Honestly, you don't really pay attention for the integer operations. You just care about the floating point operations uh, per second. Why? Because you know when you're doing science, when you're solving equations, systems of equations, whatever, you know you, you're not <laughs> you're not doing integer operations. You know you're doing you know decimals, fractions, uh, and uh, and when you look at the microprocessor and how it works, well, you 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 see that. Um, for any microprocessor, it is easier, much, much easier to do integer operations comp compared to do floating point operations. Um, and uh, well, you know, you can measure that in cycles, actually. Um, but there is a caveat about this. When we talk about floating point operations per second, are we talking about single precision operations or double precision operations? because they actually, they are different. I mean, both of them are decimal numbers, right? But uh, there is a big difference. I, I'm giving you an example for uh, an Intel uh, Sandy Bridge processor that if you are doing only single precision uh, instructions, you have a capacity of 332.8 teraflops. But if you want to use double precision, well, the, the capacity, uh, is divided in two, you only have 162.4 teraflops. That's because that specific, in this case, for this specific processor, the Intel Sandy Bridge E5, you know, 2600, uh, you can do eight flow, uh, double precision operations per, uh, per cycle, per cycle, or you can do 16 uh, single precision operations per cycle. So one thing is second, you know, whatever you can fit in one second of time, and the other is cycle, you know, the you know the cycle of the clock, uh, you know, every time it, it ticks, how many things can you do per each tick of the cycle? Uh, so you know, just you, so you just have to pay attention, you know, when we, when you're talking about flops, are we talking about single precision or double precision? Because uh, many times vendors, in order to promote their products, they'll put some fancy numbers, and you will be like, wow, you know, look, look those numbers are impressive. But then when you look at, you know, you, you look at the details, are, are they single precision or double precision? You know, and that's when you realize like, well, yeah, I guess it's impressive for single precision, but actually it's not impressive for double precision. So like uh, GPUs, for example, you know, the, the NVIDIA GPUs, for a long time, you know, in the beginning, you were not capable of doing double, double precision operations. And even at some point, uh, yes, they did an enable double precision, but it was really slow. And it's until the la latest generations that you know they have a decent uh, performance doing double precision. And it happens that in science, you really want to uh, do double precision, you know, because double precision will give you, you know, more decimals, and therefore, you know, the results can be more precise than just with single precision. Okay, um, something else that um, we need to review are the unit prefixes. 
So I'm, I'm hoping that all of you understand when we say kilo, mega, probably giga, probably tera, but there are more, you know, bigger units uh, that actually are used. You know, I, I mean, I remember learning about this when I was probably like in high school, and you know, things like exa, theta, zeta, you know, were things that, you know, like I don't know why we're learning learning this. You know, those not, those numbers are too big. What only happens that nowadays when we talk about supercomputers, you know, when I'm, I'm going to give you some examples later on, but you, when, when you look at the measurements of their capacities, well, you know, these machines are so big that you have to use the, you know, the big prefixes like peta, exa, uh, tera, giga, you know, uh, kilo and mega actually are now just too small. You know, I mean, they're useless because they're, they're just too small. Um, so, um, for example, let's, let's do an exa a quick example. So what, what will be the uh, theoretical peak performance of the Darter supercomputer? Darter is the machine uh, here at the University of Tennessee. So if I give you the description, you know, you have seen um, previous seminars that Darter is a Cray excitatory system. It has 724 compute nodes with a dual 2.6 gigahertz, 64-bit Intel 8-core Xeon A5 2600 uh, processors, also, also called Sandy Bridge. So from this description, you know, can we get the peak performance of the of the system? I mean, it's like, like a, it's theoretical peak performance, you know, like on paper, you know, what's the maximum number of operations that can be performed on the system if, you know, everything was being used uh, in perfect harmony, uh, perfect efficiency. So in order to get that number, well, actually, this is the, this is the answer to that, to that question. Um, and uh, how do we understand uh, what those numbers mean? Well, we have 724 compute nodes. We know that these nodes are dual processor. So we know there are two processors. And we know that each processor is, has, has eight cores in it. So you know, each die will have eight little things inside. And we know that the speed of the processor is 2.6 gigahertz. So that's, that's why we have 2.6. And then the giga, you know, I can translate the giga into 10 to the power of 9. You know, uh, and you can, you know, if you look to the previous slide, uh, you can see the table. Uh, that, well, actually, let me show you. So you can see that giga, you know, is the same as 10 to the power of 9. Um, and uh, if you look at the specification for the Intel Xeon uh, Sandy Bridge processor, you will see that this processor is capable of doing eight uh, double precision uh, operations per cycle. So when you multiply all this number, you get 20, you know, uh, 240,947.2 times 10 to the power nine. You know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm not uh, expanding the 10 to the power nine. So 10 to the power 9 is the same as giga. So that's why I have 240,947 gigaflops. But you know, if I move my decimal, you know, the, the point, you know, uh, three spaces to the, to the left, um, now then I will have 10 to the power of 12. So when I look at my table, 10 to the power of 12 is tera. So this number, or the answer for this question is 240.9 teraflops. So you see, you know, that's why, you know, it's important to, to learn how to, you know, understand these prefixes, you know, giga, tera, and be able to transform from one to the other, because these systems are so big that uh, you have to use those numbers, you know, in order to describe the systems. Um, so, what's, a, what's HPC? Well, High Performance Computing, or HPC, is the application of supercomputers to computational problems that are either too large for standard computers or will take too long. So, you can have your own personal computer, it can be the latest model, you know, you can have, you know, the latest technology like processor, memory, hard drive, etc. But your personal computer will be limited by whatever is inside. You know, what you have inside, that's all you have. If you need more, you know, you can't because, you know, your computer is designed to have, you know, specific uh, uh, 
hardware inside, and that's that's all you have. And uh, well, uh, I know scientists and researchers; they can always come up with a new problem that, for yeah, somehow they cannot use their personal computer to to solve the problem either because probably you need too much memory. You know, like a laptop. You know, a standard laptop has eight, sixteen gigabytes of memory. Um, but what if you need 64 or 128? You know, like your laptop will not be enough. Maybe a workstation. Yeah, you can have a workstation with 128 gigabytes of memory. Okay, but then what if, what if you need now 512 gigabytes of memory? You know, so you can always you know come up with something more complicated. Um, and that's when you need a special computer that has the resources that otherwise you would not be able to have on your own personal computer. Uh, a desktop computer generally has a single processing chip, limited memory, and small storage space, whereas an HPC system contains thousands of processors, tons of memory, and huge amounts of storage. I'm going to show you some examples uh, so, so you can see you know, what, what I'm talking about. So where did all this start? Well, back in 1964, uh, there was a machine from Control that Control Data Corporation, the uh, CDC 6600. Um, well, this machine at the time, um, the, 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 the performance of this machine was only one megaflop. So by now, one megaflop is, you know, <laughs> you know, you can laugh about it. You know, you probably your your calculator maybe is even faster than, than, than this machine. But at this time, but at the time, you know, I mean this this was something very impressive. And uh, if you can, if you can read the quote on, on the bottom of the photo, the this machine was ten times more powerful than any other machine at the time, uh, and that's why this machine was called a supercomputer. You know, because when you compare it with any other computer, it was extremely more powerful. So that's why it's super. You know, it's, you have a computer, but if it is so powerful, then it becomes a supercomputer. And also, uh, this machine was sold for eight million dollars. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, how much eight million dollars uh, uh, in 1964 would be today, but I'm pretty sure that would be a, a good amount of a good amount of money. Uh, but in any case, uh, that machine was expensive at the time, and still nowadays, supercomputers are ex very expensive. You know. I mean, of course, they are more, more powerful, more modern, new technology, but the price tag is still very expensive. I mean, you need millions of dollars to build a supercomputer. Um, so what is a supercomputer? A supercomputer is a computer, but that is at the front line of current processing capacity. At the front line means in, in, it will usually have whatever is the latest technology in processors, buses, uh, memory, disks. Uh, supercomputers are the tool in the field of computational science and are used for a wide range of computationally intensive tasks in various, various fields. So you, you've, you've seen this uh, chart before. So when you mix math with computer science, with domain science, uh, then you get computational science. Uh, for domain science, you can have physics, chemistry, engineering, biology, social sciences, you know, uh, geology, uh, uh, whatever. Um, and then from math, you know, you have all numerical methods, you know, uh, to solve equations. From computer science, you have, you know, programming languages, hardware. And when you mix all of these together, you know, you get uh, something called computational science. And thanks to this computational science, you can use uh, you, you can use this computational science to tackle what is known as the grand challenge problems, and I'm giving you, you know, like a list of examples of different topics that are very hard, that um, uh, several, you know, like maybe 20 years ago, it was impossible to tackle these type of problems, but now because we have the computing capacity, you know, to, 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 to solve uh, the equations uh, that model these type of problems, you know, now we can actually do something about it. And, you know, there are tons of different topics to choose from. Um, so what makes a supercomputer? So a supercomputer is made of, of course, processors, memory, 
a fast interconnect a parallel file system uh, software and uh, well you need a, a lot of money you know to 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 buy this or pay for this so from all of these items which one do you think might be the most important one if you want to buy a supercomputer you think the, the software <laughs> money what do you offer money money well in my opinion yes the most important ingredient in this recipe is money because you know how much money do you have depending on how much money do you have that's what you can afford you know that's what you can buy and uh yeah i mean vendors are always more than happy to sell you you know any hardware you want but you know do you have the money to pay for it you know that would be the biggest question so uh, a, a typical supercomputer is going to have thousands of processors thousands and I'm, I'm talking about hundreds i mean i mean actually you know now now it's millions you know we're talking about millions of processors uh of course you know like you know thousands or even millions of memory themes you know like this laptop only has two and only one processor so just just try to imagine that uh the the the, the, the supercomputer you know because it's so fast you know it requires so much data to go in and out you need a specialized uh, file system. Uh, in general, you, you use a parallel file system. You know, so in this laptop, I have a file system. You know, the Mac has a file system uh, for for these Apple laptops for Mac OS that run Mac OS. But in this but in this case, you know, you need special hardware, special software uh, that will run on a supercomputer. Um, you need an incredibly fast interconnect. You know, like this machine right now is in a network, you know, the wireless network, you know, that gives me access to the internet. Um, it has a bus topology, you know, but uh, if I want to run a super, you know, if I, if I have a, if, if I want to uh, have a bunch of laptops and they are all connected to the wireless and pretend that I can build a supercomputer with that, you know, I just, it's, it will never happen, you know. I mean, just, 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 it's, yes, it's, it just won't be good enough. Uh, for a supercomputer, you need something uh, very specialized to do the, you know, the communication exchange really fast with almost no overhead, uh, very efficient, very efficiently, such that your application, in general, your parallel application, can run as fast as possible. Because in, you know, most of the times, all your parallel applications will need to transfer information back and forth. And uh, when we learn more about you know, par programming in parallel, data transfer is incredibly expensive. And you have to do everything you can to try to avoid it. And well, software, you need a lot of software. Um, sometimes it's like specialized software. You know, uh, most of the supercomputers will have you know, a specialized operating system. So uh, in this laptop, I'm running Mac OS. I'm sure that you know you can always build you know your own computer with fancy 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 hardware and run Linux on it. Sure that you know that, that's fine. But uh, the vendors of these machines they have invested the time and the money to make sure that uh, they'll give you an operating system that has been customized for the hardware that they are selling you, such that you know it runs as efficiently as possible and there is you no know, no overhead. You know like. Why would you? Why would you have to run a web server? You know, on your computer. No, you know, if you're not doing, you know, yeah, web server right? or email server, for example. Uh, yeah, you need that. You know, scientific applications. Either you can make your own, or you can actually use one that you know somebody already made for you. You know, uh, there are tons of scientific applications, and usually uh, uh, that software is already available in uh, at the supercomputer. So you just have to use it. Uh, numerical libraries. There are some free numerical libraries, but there are also other libraries that you have to pay for. Uh, so you know that means money. You know, uh, and they can be very expensive. And uh, and sometimes they can even charge you by how many processors do you have. You know, so the more, the bigger the machine is, the more expensive it is. Uh, compilers. You know, you need a specialized compiler that that knows how to compile your code to be efficient on the on your current architecture. You need tools for optimization and profiling. Um, 
you need tools to visualize, you need tools to do the post-processing, you need tools or software to do the data transfer. So, you know, you need a lot of tools, a lot of software, a lot of applications uh, to run or be supported on your computer or supercomputer uh, that will allow you uh, to do what you want, you know, and be a happy user or successful user. Uh, there is, I, I put this slide here because um, when we talk about software, uh, all the supercomputers I know, uh, they are meant to be used by several users at a time. So, you know, they are shared resources. So, you know, not like, you know, they're so, so big and so expensive that like, it doesn't make sense for one single user to use these machines. Um, so, the, the, there is a need for a special software. In this, call, in this case, it's called a tune system, which is a you know, piece of software that will somehow manage the load and the resources available such that multiple users can submit the job and then the queuing system will take care of the details on when, where, you know, if there are any priorities, you know, because this is a professor and the other one is a student, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the queuing system is there. So on my machine, on my personal computer, do I have a queuing system? No. If I run a program, it just runs. On a supercomputer, it is usually a queuing system, and I cannot just run a program. I actually need to submit the program to the queuing system, and then the queuing system will take care of the details on, you know, when and where to run the program. So here are some examples of uh, supercomputers. Um, I got this list from something called the Top 500. I'm going to talk more about it in a few more slides. So uh, the fastest supercomputer for open science in the world is called uh, Tianhe Tools, uh, and this machine is in China, the National Supercomputer Center in Guangzhou. I'm sure how to pronounce it. Guangzhou. Guangzhou. Canton. Canton. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in China, <laughs> and uh, this machine has 3.1 millions of cores. 3.1 million and one petabyte of memory. The number two supercomputer in the world is called Titan. This machine is in, uh, this machine is uh, in Oak Ridge National Lab, so it's not far from where we are. Um, this machine only has 0. Uh, 0.5 million, of course, and 0. 0.7 petabytes of memory. But still, you know, it's number two. Uh, so not necessarily, you know, the num the you know the number means you know how powerful you are, you know. Uh, number three is called Sequoia. That machine has 1.5 million cores and 1.5 petabytes of memory. It's a blue IBM Blue Gene. Uh, number four is a machine in Japan called the K supercomputer. It has 0.7 million cores and 1.4 petabytes of memory. Number five is called Mira, the Mira supercomputer at Argonne National Lab. It has 0.8 million cores and 0.76 petabytes of memory. Uh, so, I mean, just try to think of it. These are, we're talking about millions, you know, millions. It's just, it's just, these machines are huge. Uh, this is a machine. This is a, this is an example of a machine available through the Exceed program to you know through NSF. Uh, it's ranked in number seven so far, and it only has 0.4 million cores and 0.2 petabytes of memory. Uh, so you can see, you know that the you know the the farther farther you get from number one position, you know your your numbers are smaller, but still you know they they are impressive. Uh, here are some specs about that machine called Stampede, available through, through the Exceed program, you know, from NSF funding. So how do you use these machines? Well, most of the times uh, you have to use a Unix terminal, so you need to learn Unix or Linux. And you open a terminal, you do as an SSH, what is called an SSH connection, to connect from your personal computer to this machine, like a server. And then you type commands, you know, you type commands and then the machine does whatever you ask through these commands. But you can also do use something called a science gateway. 
So this is something that is becoming more and more popular, especially for users who don't want to deal with units or commands. They, you know, they they love the internet. They love, you know, a web form, a web interface. So they are more than happy to, you know, just click and point, you know, with the mouse. So a science gateway is going to be a framework that, you know, is going to be a, a portal, like a portal, a web portal on, through the internet where you can, you know, uh, set some parameters and then with the click of a button you can submit your, your job to run on a supercomputer and when the job is done it will come back you know and show you the results you know every, all via the, the web and well there are tons of different um, uh, projects that are available this way and you know you can look at that link to see the different gateways that are available to the exit program you know and these are ideal for for users who you know they don't want to deal with Unix, and uh, you know they just want to deal with their, their science, and they are more than happy to just use a, a web interface. Uh, this is an example for a, a specific uh, uh, gateway, and you know just so you can see how it looks like. Now let's talk about an HPC center. So we did talk about uh, a supercomputer. Now let's talk about an, H an HPC center. So what is an HPC center? Well, it's going to be a place, site, where they have supercomputers or HPC resources. They have people, you know, the system administrators, you know, user support, uh, technicians, uh, computational scientists, you know, secretaries. Uh, there has to be some physical space, you know, where they are, you know, like a building, you know, offices. They need to have power, you know, uh, because these machines, these supercomputers, they consume a lot of power. Uh, hopefully, they have a way for you to archive your information. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, usually when you run a program, the information is saved in the parallel file system, which, which runs on hard drives. But then, uh, usually, those uh, storage environments have, you know, a limited capacity, and you're supposed to get your information out of there. And if you can't get it to your personal uh, cluster, uh, or workstation, laptop, then you can you should archive it so that you know it doesn't, it doesn't get erased. Um, the center will hopefully provide you with a fast. Uh, uh, fast networks to connect from this side to other sites, especially if you want to transfer information. Um, since these machines are so expensive, uh, they are so big, and there will be many users, uh, hopefully the center will offer a way to coordinate how the time is allocated to different users. Um, and, well, since these machines consume a lot of power, a lot of this power will be transform into heat and the heat has to be dissipated so they'll they, they're gonna have they're gonna need some um, fancy uh, cooling uh, the devices to cool down the, the, the supercomputers and of course you need money to run all of this or pay for this so once again I'm gonna ask you from all these ingredients to uh, build your own HPC center, which one do you think is the most important one? He goes for the money. People. People. Any other ideas? Stuff and money. Eh? Stuff and money. Money. Maybe also the money. Is that what you said? What would you say? I'm not sure if I'm saying kind of perhaps the archive. Archival? Archival means the structure. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. So, I mean, just to keep moving, uh, uh, in, my, in my opinion, from what I've seen, the most important ingredient here is going to be, again, the money, you know, because depending on how much money, you know, usually like funding, you know, depending on your funding, that's, you know, uh, that, that defines what can you buy. How many people can you hire? You know, the, or the quality of the people that you can hire. You know, can you pay for the power because it's going to be expensive? Uh, and uh, can you pay for you know these fast 
network to connect to other centers, etc. So yeah, money is going to be very, very important. Mm -hmm. So you know, in order to build a, an HPC center, you often need to build a new building, you know, to host your your machines with uh, all the special requirements needed for the machines, like you know, electrical power, cooling, water, etc. Um, remember, I talked about fast networks. So, you know, well, uh, I think the, most of the most of the researchers in the world uh, they all collaborate and with each other. You know, there, there, there is always the need to communicate with people at other places. And for people who does who work in supercomputing, they will often need to transfer data or information from one place to another. So. Many places they have specialized networks, uh, not only in the Internet to network, you know, which is what we use to, you know, just connect to Yahoo.com or another university, but like like parallel separate uni uh, networks uh, that your organization is paying for, such that you have you know special channel to go from here to uh, another lab or another university, and there are many. Uh, Network, networks like that, like the ESnet or the TerraGrid slash Exceed uh, or the UltraScience. Oops. All right. Let's continue. Um, power. So the owning a supercomputer requires you to have enough power to power this machine, you know, because these machines are so, be so big, uh, um, you need special requirements to run them. Um, so, uh, so hopefully you'll be, you, you'll have uh, the capability to get all the power you need to feed your machine. In our case, uh, we have our machines at Oak Ridge National Lab, which uh, is very close to three different power plants. So you know, at that place, they don't have enough electric power to feed any any machine they they, they build there. Um, cooling, you know, as I said, you know, these machines generate a lot of cooling. Um, so if you go to the machine room at the at the at the Oak Ridge National Lab, it's just amazing how many pumps and how noisy they are. You know, just moving all the water to cool down just the computer room. Yeah, it, it's just un unbelievable. Archival. So uh, I, I had a question about what is archival. So archival is going to be uh, a storage device. Um, in this case, I'm showing you some photos of what, they, what is called a silo, and the silo inside has tapes, you know, like cassette tapes, um, that a robot will take, put it into a drive, and then write or read information from it. And then this this silo can hold you know, thousands of tapes. So there's going to be a software, like for example, HPSSS. That's a that's a framework that has software where when you archive your information, the like a file. You know, you want to archive a file. The file is moved first into uh, a disk, and then you know, whenever whenever it's possible, then it, the file is moved into a tape. And then you know once it's done, the robot is going to grab the tape and you know store it until you need it. What's the current capacity of tapes? I think one tape can hold uh, five terabytes. Terabytes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's it's, uh, it's it's a lot of, a lot of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One one single tape. I think uh -huh. they, you know, they are like squares like this big. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, and and they, and they are like this, this, this way. Um, yeah, I think. I, well, I mean, the, the new ones. I think the new ones they have four or five terabytes uh, per tape, well, no, a single tape. But then, you know, believe it or not, there are users, especially you know, in, in the supercomputing world, that they can create a file which is larger than five terabytes, a single file. So then, you know, you have to be careful that, you know, how can you split your file because it won't even fit in, in a tape like that. Um, so, um, 
the Department of Energy has a program called the Insight Program. So uh, on, the, on a previous seminar, they talk about it, and also they talk about Exceed. So usually your super your uh, your center will will be uh, associated with one of these programs, uh, depending on where the funding comes from, and uh, that's how you can allocate for time uh, on, on your machine. Uh, I I am a member of the National Institute for Computational Science, and uh, our funding comes from the NSF. And uh, that's why we are part of the AC program. But you know, you can you can also go to the Department of Energy, and even if you go that route, you know, you go to the INSET program. And uh, uh, you know, we uh, what was it like the two seminars ago? You know, they talked about this. If you are curious, you can go to our to the website of the seminars um, to look for the video, the recording. If you if you are curious and want to learn more about how to get a time or an account. Through these programs, um, the Department of Energy has many centers. Here's a, a list of uh, the different centers they they fund. You can see Oak Ridge National Lab there. The Department of Defense, you know, uh, also has a bunch of uh, centers where they also have uh, supercomputers. Uh, the NSF also has their own centers. And uh, Nix, you can see Nix uh, there. Uh, I'm a member of Nix. Um, here is uh, something I, 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 I want to discuss with you. What is the difference between a resource and a service? So like my center, NICS, Nix, we offer resources and also we offer services. What's the difference? A resource is like hardware, you know, like a machine, you know, like Darter is a, is a computer, Nautilus is a computer, Mars is a computer, HPSSS, you know, so like, you know, archiving hardware. But a service is being able to give you user support or consulting, or maybe software like a framework like the grid services that offer a bunch of uh, different services like file transfer or remote. Uh, job execution, etc. Or there's something also called Unicorn that the that, that seed is trying to push, uh, which allows you to run jobs uh, from your personal computer uh, to to the different machines available to to exceed, and they offer you you know this fancy uh, user interface like client that runs on your computer, and graphically you can sort of like you know drag and drop jobs to run on a, on a machine, and you know. Uh, um, it's like a it's like a GUI, you know, that um, that will allow you to run jobs similar to the to the gateways, but uh, this is a like a Java application that runs on your on your computer. So I just want to make sure that you know you understand the difference between resource and service. That you know most of the centers will offer both, you know, the resources and services, and they are different. Uh, this is just to show you that there are. Uh, uh, all kinds of different uh, research being done on a supercomputer. Uh, this slide is, is old, but you know I just want to show you that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is. You know, you know, you, you can if you need computing power, you know, you, you can have access to a supercomputer. It's amazing to see that it's one of the smallest uh, <laughs> slides is computer science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what can you do with it? Well, you know, on the on the on our first seminar, if you haven't seen it, you know, you should probably look at uh, go to our page and you can see the video about it. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different stuff that you can do, to that types of research. Um, well, this is supposed to be moving anyway. Um, and well, not only in academia, at universities, you need uh, you, you want to use supercomputers, but also uh, the industry because you know the industry they also do research for for their new pro new products, and uh, it's uh, amazing that even for movies, you know, like DreamWorks. I don't know how many of you saw this movie, The Crude. Uh, this was one of the latest movies from them, I think last year or two years ago, and uh, here you can see, you know, like. Uh, the computing, computing uh, resources they need to render the movie. 
you know, like they, they use a farm with 20,000 processors. They generated 70 terabytes worth of data from a movie. You know, it's, it's um, interesting. So um, I told you before about the top 500 list. So the top 500 list is a um, project that was launched in 1993. Uh, one of the members is Jack Dongara, who has his, his office here in, uh, in this building. Uh, the idea behind the top 500 is that you will benchmark all the fastest or most powerful supercomputers using something called LeanPack. Uh, that's a benchmarking uh, program, which basically all it does is it's going to try to solve a set of linear equations, AX equals B, uh, using a dense random matrix A. And basically, you see how fast can you do it? You know, that's, yeah, that's just a question. You know, how, how fast can, can, can you solve that, that, that problem? Um, this list is updated twice a year, so in June, and the next one is in November, so this month. So in in like two weeks, there is going to be a new list. So here I'm just showing you the first eight, the first eight uh, entries in that list, or which translate into the eight most powerful supercomputers for open science in the world. I'm sure that this list is going to change. So in two weeks, you know, you can go to that website, top500.org, and see what's new. You know, I wouldn't be surprised, like, China, you know, now has another supercomputer, or maybe another country, like, you know, Russia, France, you know, who knows? Um, I have a computer in this list. Um, just to give you an idea on how technology changes, you know, many of you have heard, you know, the iPhone 6, you know, from Apple. So according to a website I found, the iPhone 6 has the iPhone 6 has a capacity of one point no 1,378 megaflops, the same as 1.3 gigaflops. Uh, and then when you look at this chart since 1993, basically all the way to 2014, you can see that if you were able to go back in time you know, like in a time machine, 20 years ago, and bring an iPhone 6 with you on your hand, you will be holding uh, basically a super, you know, one of the uh, one of the uh, 500 most powerful supercomputers in the world at the time. You know, back in 1993, even 94, and probably even 95. You know, that that that's incredible how how technology is changing. Um, but this is, just, this is just to give you an idea, you know, uh, how things are moving. Um, here's one, uh, one other item I, I, I want to clarify, capability versus capacity. So Google, for example, has in, an incredible amount of computing resources, you know, such, uh, such that any user in the world, you know, whenever they type a query, you know, where is something, you know, or I want to buy something, I'm looking for something, you know, they will return the results ASAP. And, uh, and yeah, they have an incredible amount of computing power um, around the world. But that is different to having one single computer in a single room with also like thousands of processors and thousands of uh, memory themes. So capability computing uh, stands for using the maximum computing power to solve a single large problem in the shortest amount of time. You know, like you have a single problem and you want to solve the single problem. But capacity computing stands for you have thousands of tiny, tiny little things like, like web queries uh, to Google, for example, and you want to solve all of them, you know, at the same time. So, you know, that, that's just something to clarify, you know, the difference between capability and capacity computing. So in this case, for us, in the supercomputing world, we often talk about capability computing. And then, well, once you have, you know, some incredible, uh, you, you, you run your program, you produce results, 
then it's time to visualize. And you know, there are tons of visualization tools out there uh, or resources like this at Orchestra National Lab that will allow you, you know, to have these incredible graphs that uh, that you can play with to visualize your information. Um, so that's it. Here are some links for you to go look for some more information. And um, well, if you have any any questions, you know, I'll be more than happy to to respond them to you. Yeah, I have a question. A very yes, you have a question. I'm curious about the, the Google when you talk about Google mm -hmm. communication in the standard. Mm -hmm. So how what uh, so the, you're talking about you're focusing on the uh, capacity, mm -hmm. right? So for the capacity, do they use the same amount of C CPU like as in supercomputer? I'm pretty sure that they use they also have like millions of processors on like you know different compute uh, like compute nodes. Uh, but I think I don't think they, I think they call them like farms, you know, farms of nodes. Yeah, I think that I think yeah, I think there is a term called farm, you know, farms, that you know, like a bunch of servers, nodes that are there just to, you know, to process the different queries. So what what is the fundamental thing differentiate their computer with the supercomputer? Like the structure difference or there anything different? The, the the objective, you know, like with the, with the capability or supercomputing. You want to have a single problem, one single problem uh, that you're trying to solve, and you're going to use thousands of millions of processors to solve it. Whereas with capability, you have tiny, tiny, small jobs, like a job query of like, you know, where is Redwood? You know, and then and then you have to look into a database, and then in the database you look, you know, for the entry, and then you do some matching, and then you return to the result, you know, a list of options, um, and then. To do that, you just basically you know, you're gonna have some framework like software that is listening or waiting for queries, and then whenever there is a new query, it just sends the query to the farm, to whomever is available, and you know just like go back and forth. For example. So I have a simple question: What if like people say Google said I want to just buy the supercomputer in Oxbridge? Can I can he immediately like in short period of time transform the supercomputer in Oxbridge for their purpose, the business purpose? Well, that's a very specific question that I don't know because I don't know exactly how Google works. Uh -huh. I know that they actually they they, they build their own machines. Uh, they build their own machines. Yeah, they build their own machines. I, don't ask me the details. I, I don't, honestly don't know much about. <laughs> no, I don't think. I don't. Think, <laughs> I don't think so. But but, honest, but I don't know. Honestly, I do not know. I mean, I would I wouldn't be surprised that they run like like uh, Chrome OS. I don't know. But I know that they build their own, their own hardware to their own specifications for you know what they are doing. Um, uh, so I don't know how quickly they will be able to just transfer uh, you know what they normally have into a, a, a supercomputer the way we you know we know it. I see. I see. So even not participating into this like racing for the supercomputer. Yeah. The no, they are not. They are not. It's like business secret. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a bunch of companies, you know, like Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Yahoo, uh, GoDaddy. You know that they have farms of of, of computers out there. Apple. But I don't know if Apple offers services like that. But maybe. Right? Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So anybody, anybody in this business of cloud computing, yeah, that's right. Anybody in the business of cloud computing. Is gonna have you know some farms uh, out there, uh, but uh, but yeah, but the vision is, is a little different to the what we have in a supercomputer or a scientific supercomputer. Um, any other any other questions? I was on, let me see. Let, let me look at the chat. Um, Okay, uh, there was a question at the beginning on what is the difference between MIPS and FLOPS. So let me just repeat that FLOPS uh, relates to floating point operations and MIPS relates to integer, op integer only operations. You know, like one plus two equals three. That's an integer operation. Whereas 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4 you know, equals 0 0.5. That's a floating point operation. 
floating point operation. And then, and then we have per second, you know, how many can you do on a second? So as a human, you know, how many operations like that can you do on a second? Uh, one, maybe, <laughs> maybe two, you know, if you are very fast. But the machine, you know, basically uh, a, a modern processor, basically on in every cycle of the clock, the internal clock, you know, like we saw in the example of the Sandy Bridge, they can make eight, you know, uh, double precision uh, operations per cycle. And then you multiply that for, you know, like seconds, etc. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions. All right. Uh, well, thank you.